Flannery O'Connor was a short story author from Georgia who wrote bizarre stories uh, about people in the South. Her stories are so strange that she's sometimes called a, a gothic short story author, writer, uh, like people who put on gothic dress and makeup. It's, they're very dark at times. One of her most quoted stories, uh, at least by Christians, is entitled, A Good Man is Hard to Find. The, the two main characters are a grandmother traveling with her son and his family to Tennessee, uh, and an escaped convict who's called the misfit, who's on a murderous rampage in the South. After her son has an accident, uh, driving the car on a backcountry road, they're stranded. And guess who comes along to find them? The misfit. After taking the rest of her family out to the woods and murdering them, he sits down and has a conversation with this grandmother about Jesus and the resurrection. Then he murders the grandmother. Flannery O'Connor uh, who was a Roman Catholic, was questioned why she wrote such bizarre and violent stories. In defense, she answered that you have to shout to people who are almost deaf, and you have to write in really big letters to people who are almost blind. There are some surprising things in Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. He, he he, he says calling people names in anger can lead you to hell. He talks about fighting lust by cutting off your hand or plucking out your eye. The strangeness continues this week in his brief but very powerful teaching about divorce and oaths. This is Jesus speaking loudly to almost deaf people and writing in big letters to almost blind people. If you take him in a, in a really rigid, literal way, without understanding the setting and the point he's making, it's easy to misunderstand him. This explains why, as Brad told us last week, in, there was an early church council that actually wrote to the church and said, stop cutting off your hands. <laughs> people who misunderstood Jesus. It also explains why we, we've spent more time in our introductions to explain the, the background of Jesus' teaching. We really want to help you, his followers, his disciples. We want to help you read the Sermon on a Mount in a way that makes sense of the teaching and, and helps you to live a flourishing life. His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. He really is gentle and humble of heart. But at the same time, there's teaching that we need to hear. There is a yoke that we need to put on. There is a burden to bear in this teaching. There are two examples of greater righteousness that we take up today. Uh, they relate to one another as well as to what has gone before. Uh, in the previous example of greater righteousness, Jesus explained the true meaning of don't commit adultery. The true meaning is, is that adultery uh, is just as much about what is going on in your heart as what you're doing with your body. The big idea of, of that passage could be paraphrased as be true to your marriage vows and keep the marriage bed undefiled, in the words of the writer of Hebrews. On the heels of this, in the next example, Jesus says, don't divorce your spouse, except in the case of adultery. Then Jesus introduces another example of, of greater righteousness that has to do with speaking oaths. In our Bible study, John Stott actually combined these two together in the same lesson under the heading of faithfulness in marriage 
and speech. And that really is the big idea of today's message. Be faithful and true to your word. I want to read the passage in Matthew 5. um, And I'm just going to read 31 and 32 and take these two uh, greater righteousness uh, items one by one. So beginning in verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. This teaching on divorce is Jesus' briefest treatment of the greater righteousness passage. Um, as, we, as we think about what's, uh, what righteousness is required, it, it's less than half of the, of the length of any of the other examples. Just two brief sentences. And that's surprising because this was really a big issue in Jesus' day, and it, it's also a, a big issue in our own day. So it's surprising that he's so, so brief. Um, it, part, of the, part of the reason for that may be that later on, Matthew actually records a more extended time of Jesus teaching on the subject of marriage and divorce in Matthew 19. In fact, I'm, I'm going to refer to that and talk about that passage a little bit and draw on some of those elements. But I, I want to do so in, in a kind of minimal way um, because the teaching on divorce, as we have it in the Sermon on the Mount, is short but very power-packed. It's a little like taking a punch to the gut from Muhammad Ali. I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to knock the breath out of you. And we should, I think, experience it that way, even as we read and as we preach it. But I want to, I want to, to front what I'm going to say with, with this pastoral concern. So I want everybody to make sure you hear what I'm going to say right now. Um, Sam Storms um, uh, is a pastor and a scholar, and he's got actually a very lengthy treatment of divorce in the Bible and his website. And so if you really wanted to read something more about that, that, I would recommend it. But one of the things that he says is that... Um, that we're trying to do two things at the same time when we talk about divorce from the Sermon on the Mount or wherever. And it feels almost impossible to do it. I really feel that even as I prepared and as I'm preaching to you. Two things. On the one hand, we are trying to uphold the value and the seriousness as well as the beauty of marriage. And at the same time, we want to minister grace and love and mercy to those who have gone through the disappointment and the stigma of divorce. I'm going to come back to those two things later and address the concerns more more directly. Um, I'm just talking about it here right now because I don't want anyone to despair over Jesus' teaching. Jesus' teaching is the best medicine for our souls. But we're going to have to sort it out carefully and understand all that Jesus would say to us. And here's just a really important observation. Jesus actually is not addressing divorced people at all in this teaching. He is addressing married people. So if you've been through a divorce, I want you to just take a deep breath, listen to what Jesus has to say, and gain his wisdom, but recognize that he is not shouting at you. 
in these words. The Old Testament teaching that Jesus refers to um, is actually comes from Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. And, and I want to read that passage. When he, when he says, you've heard it said, this is, what, this is the passage he's quoting. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house. The passage goes on to forbid the original husband from marrying that woman again once she's left his house, once he has divorced her. That part of the passage is actually not relevant to what Jesus is going to say. What is relevant is that there was strong disagreement about the meaning of this passage among the Jewish people. This disagreement is exposed actually from the question that came to Jesus through the Pharisees in, in Matthew 19, where they, they come up him, to him and they come to test him. That indicates that it was a controversial subject. They come to test him and they say, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? This strong disagreement among the Jews was owing in part to the vague language in the law of Moses. About half of the rabbis took a conservative view that the indecency found in her was some kind of serious misconduct, but not necessarily adultery. At the same time, there was a, a more liberal-minded interpretation of Moses that allowed divorce for any cause whatsoever. Um, um, most famously, one rabbi taught that if your wife ruined your breakfast, that was good enough reason to divorce her. Another example was that if you found your eye roving to women who were prettier than your wife, that was justification for divorce. Um, so there were some strong disagreements among them about the justification for divorce from Deuteronomy chapter 24. Jesus is going to raise the bar on divorce for both of these groups, for both of these parties. He is explaining a greater righteousness. It's not so hard to understand, I think, what Jesus is saying about divorce. Now, I know that it is hard to understand. Um, but it's not so hard to understand. What is really hard is to live this out. That's what's really hard. In Matthew 19, Jesus amends the teaching from the Mosaic Covenant by actually by taking the Pharisees and his enemies back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2. So he says... Here's his answer, his initial answer to them when they say, is it lawful to divorce for any cause, for any reason? He says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And, and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, Jesus says, let not man separate. Jesus is really not enacting a new legislation, new law about marriage. He's reminding them of God's original design. Brad told us about this high view of marriage last week, but I actually want to repeat some of the things that he said. And the reason why we need to repeat these things is because our biggest issue is not our views of divorce. Our biggest issue is our views of marriage. So here are four important truths about marriage. I'm not going to elaborate very much on these, but just remind you. Number one, God made mankind in his image as male and female and ordained marriage between a man and a woman. 
Number two, marriage is a man and a woman, woman leaving their families of origin and cleaving to one another in a relationship that supersedes their previous family commitment. They are connected to their family. They never stop being connected to their family of origin. But their marital bond establishes a new family commitment. Number three, marriage is a sacred one flesh bond that is body and soul. Being one flesh means so many things, but not least of which is that a husband and a wife are, are constituted by God a new family. Marriage has the purpose of companionship to alleviate aloneness and partnership to rule together over God's creation and procreation of children to multiply and fill the earth. And finally, the marriage bond is a permanent relationship that is not to be broken. Let not man separate, Jesus says. Jesus does something new in Matthew 19. He does do something new. He enacts new guidelines for kingdom disciples that set aside Moses and the guidelines for ancient Israel. So he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. Do you see how divorce also is a heart issue, just like every one of these things that we've looked at in Matthew 5. But from the beginning, it was not so, Jesus said. Jesus' disciples need to go back to the beginning. This brings us back to the Sermon on the Mount. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Let me just make three brief observations. Jesus addresses Husbands, actually, in this teaching. And the greater burden is on their shoulders, at least in the first century. Jesus, secondly, Jesus assumes that wrongful divorces and remarriage are going to take place. He assumes that in his teaching. And then he raises the bar for everyone that the greater righteousness of the kingdom is don't divorce your spouse except on the, in the case of adultery. So, how do we walk the knife edge of truth between upholding the value and seriousness and beauty of marriage and also ministering grace and love to those who have gone through the disappointment of divorce. Here's my attempt to do that. I, I want to actually address you as three, in, as three different parties, three different groups. So the first I, I would address is just simply, Jesus doesn't address divorced people here, but what would Jesus say to the divorced? You know, again, for those who are divorced, it's hard not to hear this and feel like Jesus is shouting at you, but he's not. Secondly, there are exceptions that allow for divorce, and I think that's really important to say here. One exception is addressed here, infidelity to the marriage vows. There are other exceptions, and I'm not going to talk about those in this, in this sermon at all. I'm going to focus on what Jesus is saying, and he simply gives one exception, but I, along with many Bible-believing pastors and church leaders, believe that the New Testament does also describe some other exceptions. Um, and the, the advice and counsel that I would give to you 
is that if you're troubled about this and you, you haven't been able to sort it out, is I would really encourage you to find a spiritual leader that you trust that can help you work through those issues uh, if you need to do that. And if you're a married person here and you're thinking about divorce, I would strongly encourage you to, to do the same. Here's something else I'd say to the divorce. We, we've, we've quoted this verse again and again. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus gives the best medicine. Fourth, if you do find that your conscience just won't let you rest about this, speaking to those who might be divorced, just know that divorce is not the unpardonable sin. In John's Gospel, we have a story about a woman who was taken in adultery. Uh, the, the, the Jewish leaders who brought this woman to Jesus told him, we caught her in the very act, and they want him to condemn and stone her, or otherwise come under the condemnation of others for not doing what Moses says. You probably remember that story. Jesus does some things, does write some things on, on the ground. And one by one, the people begin, the, even those who have brought her, begin to leave. And when he's finished writing on the ground, he turns to this woman and he speaks these words. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The gospel of the kingdom calls for repentance when we need to repent and it extends grace for forgiveness when we need his forgiveness that's what i think something of what jesus would say to divorced folk what would jesus say to the church what would he say to us well to leaders i would say that there are times when the really hard action of discipline, church discipline, will need to be exercised to help brothers and sisters come to their senses. Sometimes that will be called for. But my counsel is to use it sparingly and only in the clearest cases. Before discipline happens, the leadership and the members of the church, so I'm addressing all of us now, whether you're a member or just a regular attender, the, the, the leaders and, and members of the church need to do the really hard work of getting involved and helping others to reconcile. I mean, here we see where this teaching connects with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers. We should be involved. We need to be helping people who are having trouble and, and conflict. And when divorce happens, third thing I'm going to say to you, the church, when divorce happens, the leadership and the members of the church need to do the really hard work of staying connected as far as it is possible, as far as it depends upon us, staying connected to those who have experienced divorce. I know that we don't have, and I, when I say we, I don't mean Christchurch, I mean churches in general. I know that we don't have a very good reputation on this, but we can do better and we want to do better. Lastly, I, I want to address those who are married. And I want to address you by just telling you a little bit about Karen and my story. Um, 
I, of course, asked her permission to do this. At our 25th wedding anniversary, our standing joke was that we had been married 25 years and 15 of those years happily. <laughs> um, except Karen usually said 10 years, and I exaggerated and said 15. Our marital relationship, I've compared it to this on more than one occasion, and it's interesting there's just a new movie about this relationship made in the last year or two. I compared our relationship, it was kind of a, had a Desi, Arnez, Lucy dynamic to our relationship. There was lots of passion and lots of fireworks, and neither one of us knew what we were doing, which is a recipe for conflict. Um, I, I think I've said enough, you get the picture. <laughs> Two practices kept our marriage intact. We've been married now for 49 years. Two practices kept our marriage intact. One, we were clear before the Lord. When we got married, we were clear before the Lord with ourselves and with one another that divorce wasn't an option unless we encountered an exception. Our marriage is a testimony that, that marriages that are not doing very well, I, I want to say bad marriages, because there, there are bad marriages, and there were times when ours was really bad. I just want to say that by the grace of God, that if you keep going in the same direction, although it may be a really long journey, bad marriages can get better. <laughs> they can. So that's the first thing. We made up our minds. That wasn't an option unless there was an exception. Secondly, we developed the practice, and this is really important. It, it, these two things just go side by side. We developed the practice of confessing our specific sins in the marriage relationship to one another daily when we committed them, when there was an offense, and extending forgiveness to one another when we did that. We practice, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And folks, there were times when we failed to do that. I, I'm laying there with the covers up to my chin saying, when is she going to admit? <laughs> I know she was doing the same thing. But we didn't do that very often. We really tried to practice daily before, the, before we went to bed of, of, of reconciling, asking for forgiveness. We would not let one another off the hook, which usually means both of us are asking for forgiveness. And I think that's one of the, one of the practices that, that so strengthened and kept our marriage going because we really did that and we really meant it. We did really forgive. So I, I like what Hebrews says, and I think this sums up, in, in some ways, this, this part of the message. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Be faithful to your marriage vow. Which brings us to the second part of, of today's sermon. And it won't be quite as long. To be faithful to your word. From Matthew chapter 5, 33 through 37. So let, let's read the next part of the passage. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not Take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot change one hair, white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this, 
comes from evil. So we've observed a repeated pattern in each of these examples of greater righteousness. Jesus begins with something like, you've heard it said, and then he follows that uh, introduction, um, usually with a quote or, or a summary of a passage or, or some interpretation at, that's going around at the time. Then he says, but I say to you, and what follow after he says that, what follows is Jesus's either deeper explanation or perhaps even some correction. And then Jesus gives an application, even sometimes illustrations of what he says. So in verse 33, Jesus gives the introduction. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. That actually is not a direct quote quote from any one specific Bible verse in the Old Testament. There's a lot of instruction and examples about oaths and swearing falsely, and Jesus is putting at least two, if not three of them, together, probably from Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Donald Carson, Don Carson, summarizes the, the, this teaching of the Old Testament about oaths in this way. The Mosaic law forbade irreverent oaths, light use of the Lord's name, and broken vows. Once Yahweh's name was invoked, the vow to which it was attached became a debt that had to be paid to the Lord. And folks, oaths were a regular, an everyday part of, of life in doing business and relationships in Israel. What about today? What about you and I? Well, we don't do oaths so often. What everyone thinks about when we talk about doing oaths is testifying in a, in a court of law or giving a, a deposition. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Another example, though, of oaths that we do is that we, we speak vows at weddings. Uh, another example would be oaths of office that... Uh, Officials take upon being elected. And even the military and even lawyers use oaths to take on their responsibilities. But we have something, we have a, a substitute for oaths that is far more common that you and I do all the time. Think about how often you sign your name to verify that you're telling the truth. Insurance forms, medical forms, loan paperwork, government benefits. In the next 11 or 12 days, we're going to be either a, a putting our signature, digital signature, our real signature, and sending something to the IRS. <laughs> the big difference is that we are not invoking the name of our God to do something to us if we are not telling the truth. Although here's something I, I really found interesting this week. Illinois law, actually, this is actually written into Illinois law, that even if you don't invoke God's name, you're, you're, you're liable as if you did invoke his name. <laughs> the second part of the, the pattern begins each time with, but I say to you. And in this case, Jesus is addressing a, spe a specific cultural practice that must stop. He says, do not take an oath at all. So what's going on here? On the topic of oaths, like divorce, Matthew records other teaching by Jesus on the same subject. And so we find some clarity later on when Jesus speaks these woes upon the, the Pharisees in Matthew 23. And what, we're what we find out there is that the, the Pharisees and the Jewish people in general had developed a very calculated way of making an oath that allowed you to actually deceive people as to your true intent and what you were going to do. So the example, I'll just give you one of the examples that Jesus addresses. He says, Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it's nothing. In other words, you can do whatever you want to if you swear by the temple. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, then his, he's bound to keep his oath. Do you see the hypocrisy of that? You can swear by the temple, and it means nothing. 
meaning you can break your oath. But if you swear by the gold of the temple, then you have to keep their oath. There was a whole system of carefully graded speech that allowed a person to deceive and lie without liability. That's the situation that Jesus is addressing. And we see that clearly in Matthew 23. The third part of Jesus' pattern of, of teaching is an application. And here's, here's the first application he makes. Because of this deceitful practice, Jesus says, don't swear an oath at all. These are words that again have the, the metaphorical impact of shouting at deaf people. Some Christian groups like Quakers and sects like the Jehovah's Witnesses have understood this, the, Jesus to be giving an absolute prohibition on using the words of a solemn oath, like in a court of law. Their zeal for Jesus' words, I think, is really commendable. But I think they have made a wrong interpretation. There are many examples of, of God speaking oaths to His people to strengthen their faith and confidence in His Word. The psalmist reminds Israel that God spoke an oath to give them the land. God swears to King David that He'll have someone to sit on His throne forever. God swears that there will be a, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek to represent His, his people. And there are many more examples of God making oaths to people to strengthen their confidence in his word. There are also New Testament examples of oaths being spoken. For instance, by the Apostle Paul. He takes a Nazarite vow that's recorded in the book of Acts and fulfills this vow with several others who are doing the same. And in his second letter to the Corinthians, he calls God as his witness that he's, that he's not lying, but telling the truth. So we need to recognize that in context, Jesus is not condemning oaths, but in swearing falsely with spiritual cover-ups to actually lie, to commit deceit. That must stop. Better to say no oath at all than to, than to do that. The positive thing that Jesus also says is, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. In our everyday life, simplify your speech and speak the truth. That's really the takeaway from this. Simplify your speech in everyday life and speak the truth. I think there are some other ways that we can live out Jesus' teaching here. The Apostle Paul said, Having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Um, here are some ways, just think about what this would look like. To be truthful in our everyday speech with one another First of all, it, let me qualify it. It doesn't mean that we have to reveal everything about ourselves. It doesn't mean that. Truth-telling means that we are careful not to misrepresent ourselves. We need to be careful about that. Not misrepresenting ourselves in our achievements or in our failures. Truth-telling means that when we sign our name to something, we'll be doing that this month, let's be careful that we are being accurate and not fudging the truth for financial reasons. Finally, let's be faithful to our word even when it hurts. John uh, was a brother in the Lord and part of the same church that Karen and I attended in the 1970s when we were uh, going to school at Moody. Uh, John was a vocal and effective witness for Christ. In the years that I knew him, he led many people to Christ. And I know that he continued to do so. He was also a recognized leader in the church and in the, the business community. In business, he, had, he was a broker in the steel business in Chicago. 
He started his own steel business, his own steel company, after many years of experience. He wasn't making steel. He was a broker for steel. So he really knew the business. His business prospered in ways that allowed John to give away thousands of dollars for the kingdom. And he did. He was a very generous man. And he actually gave thousands of dollars as well to help people escape from persecution in the Middle East. He, was, uh, he looked like Danny Thomas, almost exactly. And he was actually an Assyrian. And he was very involved in, in helping people out of persecuted situations in, in the Middle East. In the years I knew him, John signed a contract with a firm to purchase a very large delivery of steel, a warehouse full. Before the shipment arrived, the bottom fell out of steel prices, which meant that if he received the shipment at the price his contract said he was paying, he would never get his money back um, if those prices continued at that same rate. It was such a large amount of steel uh, and such a large amount of money that it would probably ruin his company. He asked around the industry and he was advised that companies in his situation usually just broke the contract if the seller wouldn't give relief and the seller was not giving him any relief. But based on Jesus' teaching, John felt that he needed to be true to his word and trust God to take care of him. Now, folks, as far as I know, his company never recovered from that purchase. But here's what John said. He said, we did the right thing by keeping our word and maintaining our integrity and we made, we made a witness for Christ in our industry, in our business. Psalm 15, verse 2 and following says, He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, shall never be moved. You know, we may suffer loss in this world if you keep your word. But you will never be moved in the kingdom of God if you are faithful to your words. I want to invite you to stand with me.